Uh, thanks for coming out tonight. As uh, Shane mentioned, I'm the Deputy Director of the National Center for Science Education, which sounds very grand until you come to inspect my pay stuff, and then you realize it's more <laughs> utility in the field. Uh, be that as it may, uh, uh, NCSC is, is a nonprofit organization that works to defend the teaching of evolution in public schools. And it is, I'm afraid, uh, often in need of defense. So for teachers, parents, concerned citizens in general who are facing attacks on evolution education in their local communities or in their states, NCSC serves as a uh, crisis clinic. And there's the office. <laughs> um, that's my on the left. Uh, so it's been a good time recently for fans of science education and friends of evolution in the Sacramento area. Not only did we right here in Carmichael celebrate a Darwin Day on February 7th, those of us who weren't uh, watching the Super Bowl, uh, but also many of us have recently got to catch one or another of the talks that uh, P.Z. Myers was giving on this whirlwind California tour. Can I show of hands how many people saw P.Z. Myers? Oh, very good. Uh, if you don't know who P.Z. is, he's a biologist from Minnesota and a popular science blogger and a friend of all cephalopods and all around good guy, that's him there, and here he is in action against a creationist. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, in his talk in Davis at any rate, uh, PC had a very nice and economical device for organizing this talk. He presented a bunch of adjectives, puerile and uh, arrogant and <laughs> saponaceous, Okay, not saponaceous. <laughs> I wasn't taking notes. And he told anecdotes in which creationists immediately exemplify the corresponding attributes. One story shows them being arrogant, another shows them being proud, and so forth. And this was all well and good, but it struck me that he never really explained why we should be concerned about those particular instances of puerility and arrogance and saponaceousness, when after all, those are qualities that we see exemplified all about us. <laughs> uh, so it's kind of left to me to uh, fill in the gap, I think. So where did creationism, with all its plurality and arrogance and sapphicinaciousness, come from, and why should we be concerned about it, and what are its prospects? We could begin at the beginning, which as we know is 4004 BC. <laughs> But in honor of Darwin's 201st birthday last Friday, let's begin with him, seen here at ages 7, 31, and 71, respectively. Now, the seeds of Darwin's greatness were readily apparent. As his father told him when he was a student at Edinburgh University studying medicine, you care for nothing but shooting guns and rat catching, and you will be a disgrace to yourself and all of your... I can't do the next one. Well, it's true. Uh, Darwin came from a good and wealthy family, and he was clearly interested in nature from a young age, but he didn't show a lot of signs of promise of greatness. He wasn't a happy medical student, couldn't stand the sight of blood, and remember this is pre-anesthesia, he wasn't too keen about all the screaming either. Um, and he soon transferred to Cambridge University to study for the church. Uh, conventionally religious at the time, Nonetheless, his interest in an ecclesiastical career was primarily motivated by the thought that would leave him plenty of spare time to pursue his avocations of hunting and botanizing and beetle catching. Um, at Cambridge, though, Darwin met and impressed some of the best scientific minds of his time, and then his chance came. On returning home from a short geological tour in North Wales, he found a letter from one of his Cambridge tutors informing him that a Captain Fitzroy was willing to give a part of his own cabin to any young man who could volunteer to go with him, without pay, on a long voyage on the Beagle, doing a surveying job in South America. It was a post perfect for a budding naturalist, and after some negotiations, both with his family and with Fitzroy, who had reservations about taking Darwin because he didn't like the shape of his nose. <laughs> after these negotiations, I sail, I say, they said sail. Now, that's the uh, Beagle in South America, I believe. And the Beagle was to uh, circumnavigate the world over the course of five years with uh, Darwin and Fitzroy. That's Fitzroy up on the right later in his career, which is why it's the fancy uniform. Uh, both of them on board and Darwin being seasick most of the time. That didn't prevent him from doing a tremendous amount of scientific work in the five years he spent on board. And on his return to England, he continued to work in the mid-1830s 
Mulling over his hard-won geological and biological knowledge, he was already getting the glimmerings of an idea. That species of living things were not separately created, but were instead genealogically related in the tree of life, as you see from this page from his uh, 1837 notebook. And moreover, that speciation was driven by a force that he was to call natural selection. Darwin was a cautious man. He realized that these ideas would shake up not only biology, but also science, owing to their implications for religious views, and he wasn't about to rush into print. Instead, he chose to focus in on a particular narrow, narrow area of science, particles. Darwin became consumed with particle research, and soon had naturalists from all over the world sending him their collections to examine. He toyed with the idea of publishing a grand work on barnacles, as such a study was very much needed by the scientific community, or at any rate, that portion of it interested in barnacles. But of course, there were ulterior motives for publishing such a treatise. Darwin felt that he needed to establish his bona fides as, as an expert on species variations before he published his work on the transportation of spe species. And the humble barnacle, he thought, would do the trick. He spent years on it, eventually telling a correspondent, I hate a barnacle as no man ever did before. <laughs> <laughs> Not even a sailor on a slow sailing ship. So central were barnacles to his life in the 1840s that an anecdote tells of one of Darwin's children visiting a neighbor's house, being shown all around, and then asking puzzledly, but where does your father do his barnacles? <laughs> so. Darwin's work continued apace, despite his ill health and a number of family tragedies, including the death of his beloved daughter, Anne. In 1853, he received the Royal Medal of the Royal Society, the highest honor that the society could bestow on a scientist. An interesting thing to keep in mind when creationists tell you that he was a mediocre scientist six years before the origin is already receiving this honor. His thinking about uh, evolution was progressing too, on the quiet. In the 1850s, he was increasingly discussing, discussing it with trusted colleagues. And then a thunderbolt. Darwin received a letter from a young naturalist, Alfred Russell Wallace, then in the Malay Archipelago, articulating the theory of evolution through natural selection, the very same idea that Darwin had been quietly nursing for himself since the 1840s. That, by the way, is Wallace. This photograph in old age, appears on the cover of a recent edition of Darwin's autobiography. And if you see this in the bookstore, snap it up because the publisher was very embarrassed and had to recall it. <laughs> <laughs> so Darwin and Wallace jointly announced their theory of evolution by natural selection in 1858 um, at a meeting of the Linnaean Society. Real snoozer. Uh, at the end of the um, year, the president said, gee, we didn't have any, any interesting papers this year. It's a shame. And Darwin's quickly written book on the origin of species appears in the following year, 1859. Now, the contribution of the origin is essentially twofold. First, it introduces at book length the concept of natural selection as a mechanism responsible for biological phenomena such as adaptation. The uh, second contribution of the origin is not to introduce the idea of evolution, the idea that common things share a common ancestry, excuse me, a living nature, a common ancestry. That was an idea that had been in the air for a while, including uh, with Darwin's own father, Erasmus, uh, grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, Robert Chambers, and Lamarck, other people. Uh, rather, the other idea of the origin is to cement the acceptance of evolution in the scientific mind and eventually the educated public. Now, this in particular involves human beings sharing a common ancestry with the rest of the great apes, as you see in the cartoon here, to the distress of the gorillas. <laughs> now, now, among the scientific community, the idea of evolution, the common ancestry of living things, had already been in the air and was quickly accepted. Darwin had done perhaps more than anyone previously to assemble the data for common descent from diverse fields. Uh, there you are. <laughs> and among primates, if you want to zoom in, there you are. And this sort of inference in Darwin's day was increasingly well confirmed by the paleontolo paleontological record. Um, for example, uh, in comparative anatomy, it became clear that the best way to explain the similarities in the forelimb of um, vertebrates in the tetrapod forelimb 
what's just, and what you have there is basically a bone, and then two little bones, and then a whole bunch of little bones, and then five fingers and toes. But of course, that can be manifested in a number of ways. So the best way to explain the similarity is not on the basis of what um, God may or may not have had in mind for four limbs, but rather in terms of shared ancestry. And um, this, of course, this sort of reasoning continues to be powerful. Consider, for example, this sequence of transitional forms between bony fish and tetrapods. The middle one there is uh, Tectalic rosii, a recently discovered one, which in passing illustrates very well the predictive power of evolutionary biologists. The paleontologists who discovered Tectalic uh, didn't just stumble across it. Rather, they figured out where, given the um, biological and geological facts that they already had at hand, where in the Canadian Arctic would be a good place to seek such a transitional form, and by golly, they went there and found it. Uh, this inspired Roy Troll, the uh, fish artist extraordinaire, to embrace her to, or to <laughs> embrace her in the fish. Tank. And of course, one could make the same sort of case of the importance of evolution to a lot of other areas of science, including some unknown to Darwin and his contemporaries. So evolution went over pretty well. Uh, natural selection, on the other hand, didn't initially fare so well in the sight of it. People, including even um, Thomas Henry Huxley, who won himself the name of Darwin's bulldog, <coughs> failed to appreciate how natural selection could have all of the power that Dar Darwin and Wallace claimed for it. And indeed, natural selection went into a period of eclipse, as Julian Huxley called it. And theories in which evolution proceeds in direct preordained lines to goals, where evolution magically takes giant leaps in producing biological novelty, uh, were to be fairly popular around the turn of the century. Part of the reason for the eclipse was that Darwinian natural selection and Mendelian genetics were regarded as antagonists. Darwin did not have a good theory of heredity in the first place, and the Mendelian theory was thought to support a version of evolution with giant leaps, which was thought to be an act much of Darwinian evolution. <coughs> in the 1930s and 1940s, though, Darwin and Mendel were reunited in what's called the modern synthesis and extended, thanks to uh, scientists like Thomas Hunt Morgan, Paul Fisher, Fyodor Shoshansky, uh, that's Haldane there, the GBS Haldane, Sewell Wright, Julian Huxley on the second row, Eric Meyer, George Gaylord Simpson, G. Leonard Ste Stebbins. Since the 30s and 40s then, since the modern synthesis, the place of both evolution and natural selection has been scientifically secure, even though the evolutionary sciences continue to advance and deepen by the incorporation of such insights as endosymbiosis, punctuated equilibrium, and evo-devo that is to say, evolutionary developmental biology, and so much more complexity for evil. And that's reflected by the position of the nation's leading scientific bodies, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, which says the contemporary theory of biological evolution is one of the most robust products of scientific inquiry, and the National Academy of Sciences, which describes evolution as thoroughly tested and confirmed, strong and well-supported, one of the strongest and most useful scientific theories we have. <coughs> and nevertheless, evolution continues to be socially controversial, and especially in the United States. So why is that? Well, what are the theological problems, at least to a biblical religion, posed by Darwin's revolution in biology? There are at least four, which are four I'll mention, Two corresponding to evolution in the sense of common descent, and two corresponding to natural selection. So that's a of evolution. If all of life is related genealogically, if every living thing is essentially a more or less distant cousin of every other living thing, since they share a common ancestry, uh, then there's conflict with the creation accounts of Genesis in which different living things are created separately in separate and distinct creative acts of God. This is uh, Raphael's version, which is not come up to you. Uh, moreover, there's a further and perhaps more urgent conflict with the creation story of Genesis, in which human beings are not only created separately from every other creature, but are on their own day, even, uh, but are also created in the image of God, and thus have something in common with God that no other creature has. 
And here you have Michelangelo's version of that. This is shaping up to be an art history lesson. Mm -hmm. uh, well, okay, here's a post Darwinian version. <laughs> now, um, Michelangelo's is a somewhat better dress. Uh, now, Darwin was, in fact, circumspect about our shared ancestry with other primates in the origin, uh, saying with deliberate understatement toward the end of the book that if his ideas are pursued, light will be thrown on the origin of man and his history. By 1871, in The Descent of Man, uh, Darwin has come up swinging, writing in the final chapter, we thus learn that man is descended from a hairy quadruped, furnished with a tail and pointed ears. To assume that he chose the word furnished. Uh, you might think that there's a further problem here involving chronology. If it took billions of years for evolution to unfold the vast diversity of life as we see it today, then isn't there a conflict with the creation stories of Genesis, which puts creation week at about 6,000 years ago? Not necessarily. For one thing, the date of creation isn't really specified in the Bible or the Torah or the Quran. You have to make a variety of assumptions, um, often based on the biblical genealogies, to figure out when it came. Certainly, looking at the Bible from a secular point of view, it seems rather unlikely that its authors thought that the universe was 13.7 billion years old, that the Earth was 4.5 billion years old, and that life on Earth emerged from the primordial soup about 3.8 billion years old. <laughs> Nonetheless, um, from a theological point of view, it's perfectly possible to hold that the Bible doesn't really take a stand on the matter. Passages that seem to indicate a young Earth may be understood as a way of accommodating the message of the Bible to a pre-modern audience, for example. And importantly, most of the theology and biblical interpretation needed for that was worked out well before Darwin came along. The educated public basically understood that the Earth was not 6,000 years ago before Darwin published the Origin of Species. Okay. So evolution, in the sense of common descent, poses these theological problems. Hence, so too does the idea that natural selection drives evolution by producing adaptations of species to fit the environment. So too does natural selection pose theological problems. The first problem uh, is that natural selection seems to undermine one of the traditional mainstays of natural theology. Now, natural theology is the project of trying to obtain knowledge of God and of his attributes from examining his creation. Um, there's arguably a biblical warrant for this, but it doesn't really take off as an intellectual enterprise until the rise of modern science, which seem to offer new resources for establishing um, religious views. And the argument for, from design uh, itself takes off in the 17th century and gets its classic exposition in a book called, ready for it, Natural Theology, uh, published 1802 by the late 18th century, early 19th century Anglican clergyman, William Paley. This, this now, Paley argued that just as a watch's arrangement of parts organized to perform a specific function, telling what time it is, just as a watch bespeaks the existence of a designer, a watchmaker, so too does an eye's arrangement of parts bespeak the existence of an eye maker who wants for the possessors of eyes to be able to navigate around the world using visual information. Now, what Darwin did, quite consciously, as he studied Paley at Cambridge and found the argument so impressive that he later told a correspondent that he had Paley's book almost by heart, what Darwin did was undermine this argument by showing that the arrangements of means to ends to accomplish purposes in the natural world that had so impressed Paley had a natural explanation, that of natural selection. This is why uh, the biologist Richard Dawkins who avows himself as impressed with adaptation as was Paley, entitled his book about the power of natural selection, The Blind Watchman. So natural selection seems to make God's creative activity, at least as regards life, unnecessary. And for many people, such as Dawkins, uh, this seems to render the inference of God doesn't exist more plausible. Now, there are other cases in which a theological explanation, like design, has been supplanted by a natural explanation and there hasn't been so much religious resistance. There are, for example, references in the Bible to God's causing various meteorological phenomena. But meteorology managed to get established as a science, 
and even an ultimate accolade, even get its own uh, cable channel, without <laughs> major outcry. And the devout can, perhaps with some effort, regard storms and the like as natural phenomena through which God works his will in the world. But the way in which natural selection works seems like a particularly inappropriate way to conceive God as going about accomplishing his purposes. Inappropriate in two ways, perhaps. Uh, first, isn't natural selection with uh, all the blood and gore and death over the geological eons a horrible way for nature to operate? Red and tooth and claw, although that's a line that comes from Tennyson's In Memoriam, which was published nine years before the origin. Uh, Darwin himself noted this. What a book a devil's chaplain might write on the clumsy, wasteful, blundering, low, and horribly cruel works of nature. And so, if your God is working through natural selection, you might worry that you've got a sadistic God, as this cartoon illustrates. You know, this, um, the bears are all the <laughs> Or at least, <laughs> or at least a disinterested God. Uh, second, second, and similarly, although Darwin wasn't always consistent on this point, and his successors were even less consistent, uh, natural selection doesn't seem to have any intrinsic goal. It merely adapts organisms for their immediate surroundings, but has no preferred direction, which is not what we might expect. For centuries, people <coughs> thought that the universe was hierarchically ordered in a great chain of being, with God at the top, rocks at the bottom, and everybody else in between, stratified accordingly. All things so far and beautiful. After Darwin, the great chain of being is essentially replaced with a branching tree of life, in which God's providence is hard to detect. And this is heightened, of course, by the discovery, before Darwin, of mass extinctions in the history of life. For example, at the end of the Cretaceous, 65 million years ago, at the end of the Permian, 250 million years ago. If God designed life, why did he let it all but die out time and time again? Practically 75% of the Earth's life died out of the, in the end Permian extinction. Now that seems what's wrong. And so that's the second theological problem, that natural selection might be uh, thought to pose. Now, it's fairly familiar how these problems played out uh, in the West after Darwin. Uh, there were initial conflicts famously represented by the Huxley-Wilberforce debate. Mm -hmm. Seeking to score a point against Darwin's disciples, uh, Samuel Wilberforce, the Bishop of Oxford, in a uh, meeting in Oxford in uh, 1860, unwisely baited Huxley mm -hmm. by inquiring whether he would prefer to think of himself as descended from a hate on his grandfather's side or on his grandmother's side. According to legend, at any rate, uh, he quickly had his comeuppance. Huxley whispered to a neighbor, the Lord hath delivered him into my hands, and then retorted loudly that he was not ashamed of the Simeon ancestry, but that he would be ashamed to be connected with the man who used great gifts to obscure the truth. Uh, it wasn't all that confrontational. Uh, take, for example, the case of the United States. Two of the most eminent uh, scientists in Darwin's day in the United States were Asa Gray at Harvard and um, Louis Agassiz also at Harvard, who divided about whether Darwin was right. Agassiz was probably the last scientific holdout against evolution of any great eminence. Uh, they divided about whether Darwin was right, while both accepting more or less traditional forms of Christianity. Eventually, and we're still in the tail end of the 19th century here, and eventually, most mainstream denominations made their peace in the sort of evolution, while a few sects, including particularly Seventh-day Adventists, and a large rump faction, fundamentalists, resolved to oppose evolution fiercely, of which more in a moment. So it looked, though, around the turn of the century, when it came to evolution, religion was generally on the verge of reconciliation with science. So what happened? Three main factors seem important in the onset of anti-evolutionism as a mass social movement in the United States. And these are the association of evolution with German militarism, which led to the horrors of uh, World War I trench warfare. And that's the trench of Vendome. Uh, second, the widening of American public education. For the first time after World War I, students, particularly in rural areas, were being exposed to more than just reading, writing, and arithmetic. 
uh, with books like Hunter's Civic Biology, which had the concept of evolution in them. Um, that's a page from the 1914 edition. And third, the revival of evangelical Christianity in the form of fundamentalism as introduced in the book The Fundamentals. That's a modern edition there. I could find a good photogenic in approaching edition. So the first wave of anti-evolutionism involved a crusade to ban the teaching of evolution in America's public schools. And this is well under its way in the 1920s under the leadership of William Jennings Bryan, who you see there in uh, Tennessee. The ACLU recruited a young teacher named John Thomas Scopes to serve as the defendant in a test case of <coughs> Tennessee's Butler Act in Dayton, Tennessee. Now, during the trial, Bryan, who was a former Secretary of State, by the way, and a three-time presidential candidate, he articulated, even if he didn't invent, what had been dubbed as the three pillars of creationism, which have served as a sturdy platform for anti-evolution efforts from 1925 onward. And these are that evolution is unsupported science, a theory in crisis, to use a popular phrase, tottering on the verge of empirical collapse, and the only reason um, the scientists haven't fessed up to it is because, say, they're heavily invested in it. Uh, second, that evolution is incompatible with religion, or if you push a little with Christianity, or if you push a little more with true Christianity. <laughs> and um, third, that it's only fair for both sides, that is, evolution and the biblical account of creation, or creation science, or intelligent design, as the case may be, only fair for both sides to be taught. Now, Scopes was convicted, to no one's surprise, but his conviction was overturned on appeal, and the state declined to prosecute him again. So did he win, really? Not really. The winners were really the creationists, despite the fact that their champion, Brian, died shortly after the trial, and despite the hammering that they took from the big city newspapers covering the trial. So why was it a win for the creationists? Because evolution disappeared from the textbooks. And it disappeared from the textbooks because textbook publishers feared controversy, and teachers followed suit. This was something that was not really widely recognized. A Broadway play based on the Scopes trial opened in 1955, and this is a still, of course, from the 1960 movie version, Inherit the Wind, with uh, Spencer Tracy as the Darrow character for the Marches and the uh, Brian characters. Now, Inherit the Wind is loosely based on the Scopes trial, and it's loosely based on it because uh, Lawrence and Lee, the authors, were treating creationism as a dead issue, suitable as a metaphor for treating a live issue, McCarthyism. In the same way, Arthur Miller's uh, The Crucible used witchcraft, a dead issue, to talk about McCarthyism as a live issue. And really, the whole creationism evolution issue was in abeyance until the late 1950s. What happens then? The Soviet Union launches split. The United States realizes that there's a space race on, realizes that it needs to uh, improve science education, pours money into it. Well, if you improve science education, you end up improving biology education, you end up improving evolution education. And as a result, for the first time in a long time, you have serious PhD biologists helping to write textbooks. And evolution gets in. Darwin is back with a vengeance. Accurate and up-to-date information about evolution is in the classroom. And the anti-evolution legislation of the 1920s is being ignored, repealed, the Tennessee legislature finally repealed the Butler Act in 1967, and finally challenged in court. Here you have Susan Epperson, a young high school bi biology teacher in Arkansas, who was asked by the Arkansas Education Association to be a plaintiff in a case a step challenging Arkansas's anti-evolution law, which is actually a very interesting law because that's the only one I know of that was established by initiative. Usually it's a legislator, but they have the whole state voting for now, the text Susan Epperson had been told by her school district to use, uh, Modern Biology by uh, Otto and Towel, which is the descendant of a textbook that had been stripped of human evolution after the scope strata. Uh, there's human evolution or textbook. She's supposed to use the textbook, and there's a state law telling her not to use the textbook because it presents evolution. But, so Epperson sues, asserting that the statute violates her constitutional rights, the case wound its way to the Supreme Court, which made quick work of it. So with evolution back in the textbooks, 
And with legal barriers to its teaching being removed, uh, being removed or falling under challenge, we then enter the next stage of anti-evolution activity, seeking equal time. It's no longer possible to ban evolution, so what are you going to do if you're a creationist? You're going to ask for creationism to be taught. And something called creation science uh, is developed. Uh, here are two of the leading figures, uh, Henry Morris, now dead, and Dwayne Nish, still alive, both at the Institute of Creation Research. So what is creation science, or scientific creationism? Well, it's a bunch of doctrines based on a particular narrow, literal reading of Genesis, for which a scientific support is claimed. That the universe and the Earth are about 6,000, at a stretch, maybe 10,000 years old. <coughs> that living things were specially created by God to reproduce after their own kind, meaning that evolution across kinds is impossible. And that Noah's flood was a historic worldwide event responsible for most of the fossil record and for geological features like the Grand Canyon. There are, a lot of, there are a lot of young earth creationist groups out there. One of the oldest is the Institute for Creation Research. The uh, Creation Research Society aspires to be the scholarly arm of the movement. Answers in Genesis, now the largest, is, uh, was founded by a cadre of Australian and New Zealand fans of ICR. It's now headquartered in Petersburg, Kentucky, where in 2007 it opened a multi-million dollar creation science museum across the river from Cincinnati. Um, Answers in Genesis is generally uh, rasher and more interested in um, evangelism and science, so given the competition that's a comparison. Uh, young Earth creationism remains the dominant form of anti-evolutionism today, and um, these, this is sort of the more reputable branch of it. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I forgot to put on the slide, but for example, one well-known young Earth creation evangelist, Kent Hovind, is currently a guest of the federal government. <laughs> a 10-year sentence for tax evasion. Um, what I did remember the slide for, because it's more photogenic, is the pamphleteer Jack T. Chick, whose big daddy tract as a charming anti-Semitic caricature of a frothing and sweaty evolution teaching professor who, of course, is rounded by a clean-cut creationist. <laughs> available in uh, faculties everywhere. Right? Now, there were widespread attempts to require equal time for creation science, something like 37 separate pieces of legislation. And two of these attempts, one in Arkansas and one in Louisiana, were successful. The Arkansas law was ruled unconstitutional in a landmark trial in McLean v. Arkansas in 1982, including expert witnesses for the plaintiffs, such as Francisco Ayala, Brent Dollarville, and uh, Stephen J. Gould. And so devastating was this defeat that the state decided not to appeal the decision from the federal district court. The Louisiana bill uh, eventually did reach the Supreme Court, which ruled in um, Edwards v. Aguilar in 1987, that teaching creationism in the public schools violates the First Amendment's Establishment Clause. So what now? Thus begins the third phase of anti-evolution uh, in the United States. Two new strategies emerged. One was the idea of further disinfecting creationism, which, remember, had already been renamed scientific creationism or creation science. So further disinfecting creationism of its overtly religious content. Such innovations as abrupt appearance theory and initial appearance theory swiftly came and went. The version with the most staying power was something called intelligent design, um, which has as its de facto institutional headquarters an outfit in Seattle called the Discovery Institute, whose uh, logo did not just be very subtle about this. That's my God and some DNA in for Adam. <laughs> the other approach is to forego the pleasures of sketching any version of the creationist history of life on Earth uh, for the subtle but no less potent tactic of indiscriminately bashing evolution under such labels as teach the controversy, of which more in a bit. Now, intelligent design is fundamentally about finding something that can be billed as a scientific alternative to evolution while surviving constitutional scrutiny your first scientific theory that was developed in consultation with the team of lawyers. So, <laughs> consequently, 
Intelligent design proponents insist that their view does not entail any particular conception of the designer. It could be God, they can see, but on the other hand, it could be aliens from outer space, or perhaps time-traveling cell biologists from the far future. I am not making this up. For similar reasons, intelligent design strives to maintain a big tent in which all anti-evolutionists are welcome to shelter, including young Earth creationists, old Earth creationists, ultra-Orthodox Jewish creationists, Islamic creationists, and Krishna creationists. About the only anti-evolution group apparently unwelcome is a clone-crazed, alien-worshipping, free-love UFO cult. The Raelians. <laughs> <laughs> the Raelians' public announcement of support for teaching intelligence in public schools was met with a stony silence. <laughs> So, although individual proponents of intelligent design have opinions about the nature of the designer, the age of the earth, common ancestor, Noah's flood, intelligent design as a position um, has no view on these matters officially. So the central message of intelligent design is thus there, somewhere, at some point in time, some intelligent agent somehow did something for some reason to affect the history of life. <laughs> so, tactical basis. But, given that most students in the public school science classes in the United States will know how to fill in these blanks, will have notions about where, when, who, what, why, the intended and likely upshot of teaching intelligence side is clear to encourage students to acquire or retain a belief in creationism and non-acceptance of evolution. And make this mistake, the target is public schools. Uh, of Pandas and People, shown here, is the first book to use intelligent design in this specific sense. And this is a book that was constructed and marketed for use as a supplementary textbook in high school biology classes. Many people, you know, who do the science first and then write the textbook. That's not how it works for now, the role of intelligent design was not lost on a school board in Dover, Pennsylvania, one of 50, some 15,000 local school districts in the uh, country. This is a section of a map showing the boundaries of um, school districts. And if you think this was a hard to uh, freehand. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, Dover Area School District, there we go. So what's going on in Dover? In 2004, um, the school board's attempts to get equal time for creationism mutated, eventually, into a policy saying that students will be made aware of gaps slash problems in Darwin's theory and of other theories of evolution, including but not limited to intelligent design. The policy also added, somewhat mysteriously, that origins of life will not be taught. It was never really made clear why such a limitation was desirable or such a clarification was necessary. Be that as it may, a disclaimer that implemented the policy uh, explicitly referred students to no other book than a pandas and people for further information about intelligent design. No surprise then that 11 local parents filed suit, represented by the ACLU of Pennsylvania, Americans United for Separation of Church and State, and the private Philadelphia law for Pepler, Hamilton, and NLP, NCA, NCSE, um, we did a lot of work on this case. We put together the legal team. We provided uh, four of the six expert witnesses for the plaintiffs, and um, we put a lot of work behind the scenes helping the lawyers assemble their case. My colleague, Nick Komatsky, uh, deserves a special shout out because he put in about 80 hours a week over the course of a year. So we put a lot of work into this. It was fun. Intelligent design did not do well in this trial. <laughs> the local backers of intelligent design were exposed to bullies, ignoramuses, arguably even perjurers. The judge concluded that two of them had lied uh, under oath and there were talk of possible charges. Intelligent design itself was exposed not only as scientifically bankrupt, but also as stealth creationism. For example, an expert witness for the plaintiffs, Barbara Forrest, examined drafts of famous and people and testified that the book had clearly been revised in 1987 in order to circumvent the Edwards decision. One passage in a draft reads, evolutionists think that the, 
Sorry. I'm going to go the wrong way anyway. Okay, so the Sioux. There we go. Evolutionists think that the former is correct. Creationists accept the latter view from the draft. Okay, in the published version, this reads, Evolutionists think the former is correct. Design proponents accept the latter view. Forrest even managed to locate a perfect transitional form in the intermediate drafts. Evolutionists think the former is correct. See okay. design proponents accept mm. the latter view, yeah. which is what you get when you don't look to see what's happening with your search in replace. <laughs> so, thanks to uh, evidence introduced over a uh, 40 days and 40 nights, very biblical, a uh, complete vindication of plaintiffs. Intelligent design is declared unconstitutional for teaching in public schools. So as intelligent design through, not by a long shot, the new board, uh, excuse me, the Dover Area board, School Board did not appeal the decision in part because everybody who was on the board who supported the policy who was up for re-election lost. <laughs> and uh, so there was no appeal and this decision is directly precedent only in the middle federal district of uh, Pennsylvania. It's a stunningly well wrought decision, however, and like the decision in McLean v. Arkansas before, it's going to have a great influence on any future cases. So, intelligent design certainly had a setback there. But remember all those little boxes showing you the boundaries of school districts? American education is highly decentralized. Nobody can keep their eye on every school district and something else is going to be bobbing up. Nonetheless, what the big trend is going to be is an int intensification of what I like to call the fallback strategy, spreading confusion about evolution under rubrics like uh, Teach the Controversy. Even before Kitzmiller, the Discovery Institute, again, the de facto institutional headquarters of intelligent design, had signaled its intention of doing so. As you see, they're not making progress. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the direction. Instead of mandating intelligent design, Discovery Institute recommends teaching students more about evolutionary theory. That sounds good. Including telling them about some of the theory's problems. Uh -huh. And they have a long list of problems, of course, which are mainly cribbed and updated from traditional creationist literature. So, we're seeing catchphrases then that teach the controversy, evidence for and evidence against strengths and weaknesses, academic freedom. <laughs> academic freedom was sort of the, uh, you know, the new black for 2008. Um, we had something like um, 12 bills in state legislatures invoking academic freedom as a pretext for um, not teaching children properly about evolution. And indeed in Louisiana, they passed and enacted such a bill in 2008. And we're looking to see what the consequence of, consequences of this are, and they're not going to be good. Um, uh, the very newest one is advantages and disadvantages, which just surfaced in the bill introduced in uh, Kentucky, in their House of Representatives uh, this month. All of these, of course, are basically your stealth creationist tactics du jour. What they have in common is that they appeal to our sense of fairness. And why not teach all the views? And in order to make that appeal, of course, they rely on a fundamental failure on the part of the American general public to understand what evolution is and to appreciate the overwhelming evidence for it. In a survey of 33 developed countries, the United States placed next to last for the level of acceptance of evolution, leaving out only Turkey. <laughs> and because the American public tends to be ignorant about evolution, it's easy for creationists to fabricate a controversy. As this cartoon instructs us, here we have a creationist debate. The scientist says, so you see that there is certainly a debate within the scientific community about the details of evolution, but aha! You're admitting that evolution is bogus. You know, what I said was, gotcha, evolution is a fraud. Gotcha. <laughs> this is actually how creationist debates generally go which is one reason NCSC tends to uh, encourage scientists not to participate. So where this really plays out is that at the level of public education in the individual school room. For every local school district like Dover, uh, we know of a handful, and there must be dozens more, where evolution 
denial is not so blatant, but nonetheless exerts a chilling effect. As the uh, New York Times observes, in many schools, the dog ate the chapter on the origin of species. Um, in 2005, the National Science Teachers Association conducted an informal poll of its members and found out that 31% of teachers had felt pressure to de-emphasize or omit evolution in their classes, with about an equal number saying that they felt pressure to include creation in a form or not. And this means that even where the evolution wars aren't visibly raging, children are still often receiving an inadequate science education. Since as uh, the Theodosia Shepshansky, the geneticists admonished us, nothing in biology makes sense except in the love of evolution. So that's what keeps me busy at my day job at the National Center for Science Education, the only national organization wholly dedicated to defending the teaching of evolution in public schools. We're uh, colonizing the web here with uh, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, in addition to our website. We even have a uh, free weekly e-newsletter, which has some of the most discouraging news on a regular basis. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a pleasure to come out and talk to you today. It's interesting that at the institute, the institute for Creation Research, people joining the so-called faculty are required to take an oath saying they will dis disregard any findings that contradict their faith. Well, hmm. um, yeah, the, there are a couple of, there are two different oaths going on here. There's the Creation Research Society, which has a uh, rather well-known oath. The Institute for Creation Research doesn't have members as such. Uh, they do have a graduate school, and there may be a statement of faith for members of its graduate, graduate school, I imagine that there are. The uh, graduate school is actually quite interesting, so that provides me a pretext for more stories. Um, uh, Tim Sanifer, actually, up here in the first, first row, knows more about this than I do, having written a law review article about it. But uh, for years, the Institute for Creationist Research, Creation Research ran a uh, graduate school out of its headquarters in Santee, California, outside San Diego. Recently, though, they moved, picked up shop and moved to Dallas, apparently thinking that they would be able to still run their graduate school out of there. But it's a different regulatory environment. And they had to um, satisfy Texas that they um, could run a graduate school. Texas, interestingly, have decided that they couldn't. Uh, the ICR is currently suing the state of Texas over that. That should be very amusing because the lawyer for the ICR keeps on submitting 70-page uh, briefs with um, underlining in bold and different fonts and <laughs> general references to Bible verses. Generally looking kind of unprofessional. But we'll see how that case plays out. Yes? Uh, I was just curious, can you make about the apparent association between German militarism and um, evolutionary theory. And the reason I ask is that I think I've recently been looking at, you know, 19th century you know, biblical criticism. But I got, without any reference to Darwin, the Germans just fucking tore the Bible apart. They just tore it to pieces. It, as, as, as a book, they showed it was basically shreds. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, I, I know myself, I started out as a medievalist, when you start looking at manuscripts, you can see where they've been taken apart and put back together and, and redacted by one person after another. And, and what, you know, when, when you actually start looking at the Bible very carefully, you can see, you know, many hands even in, in a single chapter. But I mean, the, the Germans really were very thoroughgoing in, in their uh, in the, uh, tradition of biblical and I'm wondering, is there any connection between that and German politics? Well, there's a connection that goes by way of American fundamentalism. And American fundamentalism is in part a reaction to the higher criticism, which you know, didn't yeah. get well with them. Um, but I think in Germany, it, it, the connection is different. The, the main way that concerns about German militarism play into anti-evolution 
is through a book by a biologist called Vernon Kellogg called Headquarters Nights. And um, Kellogg had been hanging out with German officers before and right around the war and was kind of um, surprised to find the prevalence of you know, kind of biological metaphors in their thinking about you know, what, what it was they were doing in being engaged in the war. And these probably don't trace back to Darwin very, through any very... Uh, not even Dalton, but, but probably through uh, people like um, Heckel. Um, but it's, but you know, there are a whole lot of strands of intellectual influence here, and they, they need some disentangling. Um, I think Robert Richards in this new book for Heckel has some, has some discussion of this. And, uh, just off the top of my head, I can give you a quick answer. Well, wasn't the uh, Industrial Revolution and uh, the usage of the poor people kind of justified in the lines of natural selection? They, they put it into the economic sense. And it kind of fell into a like, disrepute on those lines. Yeah. Well, this is something that historians still seem to be squabbling about. Richard Hofstetter, um, very famously late in his book, Social Darwinism in American Life, um, kind of pulled from uh, various things that, for example, Rockefeller wrote and uh, some other robber barons, passages where they seem to be invoking natural selection to explain their and justify their economic success. Uh, other and later historians, including uh, Robert Bannister, have said, well, it looks like he's kind of cherry-picking uh, quotations from Rockefeller et al. Uh, there never seems to have been a school of thought that identified itself as social Darwinism. Um, you know, you find people holding up signs saying, I'm a social Darwinist. Uh, insofar as such um, doctrines were accepted, they were seem to trace back more to Herbert Spencer who was much more of a social Darwinist, so-called, than Darwin ever was. And some people have even suggested that we should abjure the term social Darwinism and talk about social Spencerism. Mm -hmm. Again, you know, these are fairly complicated issues in intellectual history that I can't do this just to. Right, yes? I read the National Academy of Scientists said they cannot say anything about religion. What stand does the National Center of Science Education have a good stand on religion? The uh, National Academy of Sciences is willing to say things about religion. Uh, for example, they have a fairly thick booklet called Science, Evolution, and Creationism that quotes various um, scientists of faith who accept evolution. And this can have, be very useful when you're confronting people who assume, unreflectively, that it, to <coughs> accept evolution, you have to give up on your faith. Um, that said, the uh, National Academy of Sciences isn't taking over this position itself. And CSC uh, is fairly similar. Uh, we're not a religious organization. We're not an anti-religious organization. We're a religious and neutral organization whose staff members, board of directors, supporters have a variety of views on religious matters for ancient and militant atheists to evangelical Christians. <laughs> yeah. Um, the younger creationists or intelligent designers, uh, they're working against the natural selection of Darwin's theory being taught in uh, schools, but are they also tackling all the other subjects in science that are the direct evidence for? Uh, for instance, I mean, uh, radiocarbon dating we learn about in school, I mean, that would kind of conflict with their views or uh, astronomy or any of the other scientists. Yeah, it depends on what flavor of creationists we have in mind. The younger creationists have to give up on you know all of evolutionary biology, but they also have to give up on huge chunks of geology, huge chunks of physics, uh, huge chunks of including cosmology and um, um, areas of physics bearing on radioisotope data like that. Um, intelligent design people, remember, don't have a position on the edge of the Earth. So some of them probably are willing to uh, uh, do a little geology bashing or uh, physics bashing, but it's not supposed to be part of their stance qua ID proponents. Um, you also occasionally see a vocational ID proponent who is also skeptical of uh, relativity. Uh, Tom Bethel, who is a journalist who's a fellow traveler of the intelligent design movement, and uh, J. Wesley Richards, who is a um, DI staffer, have both uh, published these uh, very poorly informed screens against <coughs> special relativity. So, um, often 
Yeah. Often you'll see science deniers of one stripe but being science deniers of another stripe. Uh, there are at least two people associated with the Discovery Institute who have uh, signed one of the uh, petitions uh, claiming that HIV doesn't cause AIDS. Again, that's not part of their positions as intelligent design proponents. On the other hand, it might give you to think about exactly uh, whether these guys are scientifically credible or not. Okay. What kind of scientific background, if any, do many of the authority design and or regional scientists have? It seems that they generally make things that are so misinformed as to the scientific comments about it. I can't imagine they have any credible scientists about all this work. Well, it varies. Uh, Kent Hovind, for example, um, has an undergraduate degree from a Bible college, claims to have a PhD in Christian education from Patriot University. Patriot University is not only unaccredited, but, unaccredited, but it's also operated out of a, a split level in suburban Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> His dissertation begins, hello, my name is Ken Hobine. <laughs> <laughs> so it runs all the way from the gamut from that to, for example, Michael Behe, who has a perfectly good PhD in uh, chemistry, I believe, and is a tenured professor of biochemistry at Lehigh University. So the, um, the, uh, the educational uh, levels and attainments you know, can vary widely. Um, that said, you don't see a lot of evolution about it recently. <laughs> Do you have kind of a spectrum from the flat earthers up to, you know, uh, to the ones who actually believe that, like, that uh, God has this invisible hand of guiding evolution. I mean, there's, there's, there's shades of gray in their stupidity lines. Or, uh, I, I wonder if we, if we could chart that in some kind of like Carolinas Linnaeus speciation type of way. Uh, there have been attempts to do so. If you go to NCSC's website and look, search for continuum, you'll find a fairly well-known article called The Creation Evolution Continuum by uh, Eugene Scott which kind of gives you a spectrum starting with flat earth and getting, and getting you know, more plausible. Other people have kind of schematized in different ways. So yes, there is a range. Yeah. Uh, 